Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to day two of our digital marketing conference. This is the first time we've run our popular conference as an online event. We hope that you'll find it interesting and you're able to take away some valuable insights and handy tips from our guest speakers today. Day one of the conference yesterday was brilliant, and we had two fantastic presentations from our speakers, Hannah Bewley and Katie Hart. If you didn't get a chance to join us yesterday, you'll be able to watch the recording on demand via the CIM YouTube channel. So on to today's lineup. Today we have presentations from Daniel Rouse and Anne Stanley on the latest digital marketing trends and what's new in search marketing. And then there's me, Philip Preston, your host for today. So without further ado, I'd now like to hand you over to our first guest speaker today, Daniel Rouse of Target Internet. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much indeed, Phil, and thank you everyone for being here. It's great to see so many of you here today. Let's go through and uh, I'll tell you who I am and introduce myself and then we'll go through and talk about latest trends and, and what's really happening in the world of digital at the moment. Now, what I'm going to try and do is give you a very, very practical guide, give you lots of tools that you can take away and use, take these trends and really talk about what they mean in practice to your day by day digital marketing activities. So I'm CEO of Target Internet. Target Internet is a company that works with lots of brands, helping them to plan and implement their digital marketing. Uh, I'm founder of the Digital Leadership Programme, which is an alternative to university. Um, and if you want to say anything nice or nasty during the presentation, then uh, it's Daniel Rolls on Twitter and Target Internet uh, on Instagram. And I'm going to give you a load of resources, as I say, but at the end, I'll give you a toolkit where you can download all of those as well. So everything I'm going to go through, you don't need to write down all the web addresses. You'll get all of those in the toolkit at the end as well. So these are the kind of brands that we're working with every day. Um, helping these organizations plan and implement their digital marketing. So I'll bring in lots of examples from those people. Um, I'm also a program director at Imperial College at the Business School in London, which is where I'm actually sitting today. Um, these are some of my lovely MSc students who are actually sitting down with face-to-face -face, uh, again now. Um, and I've written uh, a few books on the topic and I also do the digital marketing podcast. Now, I bring this up, not to try and get you to listen, but to show you this, right? We're sitting there. Uh, top 50 global business podcast or thereabouts next to reed hoffman who started linkedin neil patel there we've got financial times radio 4 and all these other people and this costs almost nothing to produce so why does it do so well well we focus on our target audience who's that marketers and digital marketers what's their problem they can't stay up to date a couple of years ago or a good few years ago when we started this we realized that our audience commute they spend time on train and in driving, so they over-index in terms of listening to podcasts. So by taking that target audience, understanding their user journey and their challenges, by using this channel, we're able to get into those, those people. And we get about 80,000 downloads um, a week for this, and it is literally just me and a guy called Kieran chatting. There's so nothing particularly clever about it, but always having that step back at the back of our minds of thinking persona, user journey, to make sure that we're really focusing on what we do, where it fits in. Now, in terms of the books I mentioned, there's a few here. I'm not trying to sell you a book, I promise. Um, but just to let you know, there are some chapters that I'll send through in the toolkit that you can download if you want those as well. So let's put this in context. And we, we always talk about this when we talk about trends. This is a little screenshot from uh, Internet Live Stats. Uh, and Internet Live Stats shows me what's happened so far today. And the one I'll, I'll kind of draw your attention to in the middle of the screen is the one that says how many blog posts have been written so far today over four million um, if you want people to read your blog post it's getting increasingly difficult what we've also seen that i'll come to in a moment is we do a skills benchmark with the chartered institute of marketing every year and we look at how skills are progressing and what we've actually seen is over the last two years during the pandemic content marketing skills went backwards so people haven't been improving their skills necessarily but it basically means there is more and more content um, and the quality of that content is not inherently better. So we've got some challenges around that. Um, more videos viewed on YouTube than, than searches done in Google. That's wildly misleading, like a lot of stats can be in digital marketing, because that's people starting videos, not necessarily actually watching them. The average YouTube video now has four views, and that's generally by the person that uploaded that video in the first place. Uh, yeah, lots of other videos are getting billions of views, but we've got a lot of noise. And this has been the case for years. And whenever, whenever I've done one of these uh, trends webinars over the last 10 years, this noise has just got worse and worse and worse. 
if you combine that with skills not moving forwards as quickly as they could do, which I'll talk about, we've got a, a real challenge. However, what it means is that if we can actually make sure that we do better than average, we've got a great opportunity to stand out uh, with all of this stuff as well. So I want to bring you to this idea of the hero hub and hygiene model. And what this basically says is there are three types of content. And I want to try and look at that, but try and apply it in practice. So hygiene content is the stuff that you've got, and it basically should be the best answer to what do you do. So we need to optimize it for the search engines. And we're very lucky to have Anne here who's going to talk about the latest trends of search. So I need to make sure that I'm answering that question effectively. Hub content is what we're obsessed with in marketing. It's that stuff that we create that basically uh, engages our audience. And as we've just seen, the world has probably got too much hub content. Um, we're pumping out loads of low quality hub content and it's not inherently um, the best stuff in the world. Hero content is the stuff that really drives return on investment for us. It's the content we create that drives engagement, drives traffic, but it keeps doing that in the long term. So I just want to talk about how we go about doing that from a very practical process point of view. And it really means thinking about our content, our social media, our search optimization, and bringing those things together. Um, so let's, let's kind, of, kind of get into that. But what we really want is every piece of content we create, every piece of hub content to be exceptional and to end up being hero content. So for example, I create some content, put it onto my website, and I socialize it. I tweet, I Facebook, I LinkedIn, and so on. And that drives some social traffic and some social engagement. But then, because I've created social signals for Google, Google picks this up, and I want to rank really high in Google so that I'm getting traffic for this particular content every single month. So if I go in and I look at my analytics, um, I can see here, under Google Analytics, under my behavior reports, my site content. So this is basically telling me my most popular content. And I can see there's a number of pages here. And in, in them, after these kind of 91,000 page views over January, um, I can see the blog posts that are most popular. So top 10 highest paid bloggers, how to get Google Analytics certification, um, what is data scraping, how can I use it? Now, what I don't know at this stage looking at this is where's this traffic actually coming from? So if I then drill into this, I'm going to go through and, and click on to one of these particular listings that is the what is data scraping how can you use it you can see now 2941 visits this isn't coming from social anymore there's 2671 of them are actually coming through from google organic search and we've got a little bit of bing in there um, google classroom DuckDuckGo, which is a newly popular search engine that's really focused on privacy direct traffic that's people typing in my website address or a bookmark link so what this tells me is I've created content, socialized it, but this has now become hero content because actually we wrote this content five years ago and we do update it regularly. But the point being that actually now every single month I'm getting traffic from this from, a, from Google, which means the return on investment of that one blog post is huge because I know that if my conversion rate of my website from visitor to lead is about 3%, um, every month this is driving leads. So rather than just creating a blog post, getting a spike in traffic, I mean, it might only be 30 visitors, then another blog post, another 30, blog post, another 30. It's exhausting. So we very much suggest take a step back, do less, but do it better. And we're really seeing this as a trend with our clients who are really taking notice of this now. So why does this rank well? Well, what we did is go out and look at what other content was out there and research the topic and then work out what do people want how can we do this better than anyone else? There's nothing particularly dramatically clever about it, but we realized lots of people were searching the question, what is data scraping? So we've got the search phrase in there, but then we had a hook. How can you use it? Make it clear. This is going to be a kind of tutorial. It's going to be really practical for the audience. So this is the actual blog post itself. Um, and it just says, what is data scraping? How can you use it? It's then got a big, long tutorial underneath, but it's broken down with videos as well. And why is that important? Well, it's really important because the dwell time on this page is how long people are staying on the page is going to impact our search rankings as well. And all the research we've done over the last six months has shown there's quite a direct connection between how long people stay on your pages 
and actually that will have an improvement in your rankings. And Anne will go into all the other factors about search and what's kind of changing and so on as well. So at the beginning of this blog post, we have a little video explainer. And all it's basically doing is explaining what it says in the blog post, but that's encouraging that about 30 or 40% of us that like to watch video rather than reading to actually stay on the page a bit longer. It's good for those users, drives engagement, but it also goes through and means people stay longer. That's a signal to Google and that goes through and improves my rankings in turn as well. So we thought about the content that people want. We've made sure that the content we've done is a better answer to the question uh, than anyone else. We've made sure we're thinking about improving the dwell time on the page. And that then turns that hub content into hero content. So when we're thinking about that, this is um, a screenshot from the Moz website. So if you're not familiar with the, the chap on the screen, um, this is Rand Fishkin. Rand uh, started Moz. He now runs a website called Spark Toro that I will talk about in just a moment. But he came up with this idea of 10x content. And if you haven't come across this, I definitely recommend um, the video. We had uh, Rand on our podcast um, a little while ago thinking about that as well. And what he basically says is that if you want to rank number one for content, you want to stand out from all of this noise, do less, but do it better. But actually, what you need to do is quite an in-depth process and it's not easy to do. So I definitely advise watching this video afterwards, but basically go out there and work out what are the 10 best bits of content on this particular topic. And then really think about how could we do it better, but not how can we do it one time better? How can we do it 10 times better? Well, that's actually quite a hard thing to do. Um, so you need to go off and need to gain insights. You need to understand what's out there. What are people engaging with? What's the most popular content on this topic? It may be that you're a better answer. It may be that you present it in a different way. It may be you do something particularly unique in this content, but unless you do that, your content is not going to get the engagement. It's not going to get the delight of your target audience. Um, and it's not going to achieve those rankings that you want it to achieve because you're competing with so much other content. And that's just getting worse and worse and will continue to um, over time as well. Now, this is hard to do but it's really worth that in, that investment in time. So um, a couple of tools that can that can help with this. This is a screenshot from Spark Toro. So this is Rand's new tool. And Spark Toro, this is the free version, by the way, and they're all in a toolkit that I'm gonna to give you at the end. This basically allows you to put a topic in. I put in digital marketing in this case, and it's gonna give me a load of insights about the people that are interested in that topic. What phrases they're using, what the hashtags they're using. Uh, what social accounts do they follow? What websites do they visit? What podcasts do they listen to? What YouTube channels do they go to? And what press accounts do they follow? As well as giving me the big ones, you can see the social accounts like HubSpot and Moz and Search Engine Land. It also gives me what it calls some hidden gems. So these are the small ones that still quite a considerable amount of people are listening to. This is phenomenally useful for working out what's popular, but also thinking about outreach. So if I give you an example, I said we do this skills benchmark that I'll talk about in a moment. If I want someone else to be talking about that, I could reach out to maybe Ian, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here, and say, like, Ian, we, we've got this report, and I don't just want you to publish it. What, what could I create from our data that no one else has got that would be good for your audience? So again, I'm offering them something really specific and really unique for their website. That's going to drive engagement with that audience. That, in turn, uh, could drive links back to my website. Um, and so on. So it's it's a great tool. You can have a play around with the free version. You get 10 free searches uh, a month. Um, similar web, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, but they've just updated this in the last few days if you haven't seen. So similar web, you, you haven't got analytics for your competitors very clearly. But actually what this tool will do is try and estimate analytics for any website that, that you put into it. So I put the CIM website in this case. And it's gone through and tried to estimate the traffic for the CIM website, where that traffic's coming from. Now, because I've got access to the CIM's analytics as well, I can see how, how good is that? And actually what we're seeing is it's, it's increasingly accurate. Now you don't compare your analytics to similar web analytics. You want to do apples to apples. So comparing uh, one to the other. But essentially it's identified here, competitors, similar websites, how many visits things I'm getting. It will show me their most popular content, where that traffic's coming from. So again, a really good research tool to try and understand 
audiences, competitors, the marketing channels um, that are being used and so on as well. And that can help us research this content that's going to really stand out um, and be exceptional. Another one that's particularly useful in this case, this is BuzzSumo. Uh, BuzzSumo allows me to put in a topic or a domain and it will find me the most shared content on that topic or on that domain. So a great one where you can put your competitors in and it will essentially allow you to go through and to see of all the stuff on the website what's most popular. So I've gone in here and put Dave Chaffee's website in, um, smartinsights.com, publishes some brilliant content uh, and I can see better marketing campaign briefs. So that kind of tells me people are interested in seeing maybe case studies or templates. So I think that could bring me some ideas. Um, top trends in marketing. Okay, well, we know that trends are popular. We're all here today. Um, healthcare content marketing. Okay, that's interesting. So why is that getting shared? And I could start to, to look at that a little bit as well. So really useful tools for understanding what competitors are doing. What's the most popular topic on any particular um, content area? And then thinking about how can I do less? But do it better, but make it exceptional because that's going to drive social engagement, search traffic. It's going to um, actually get the interest of my target audience, build my brand. And I've got the ability then to go through and try and get you to do something else. So some other changes are going on. There's a lot of privacy changes going on um, at the moment. Um, you might not be aware of this one. Um, this is one where Apple have basically come out and they've changed the way that any Apple mail um, allows people to see open rates. So in your email service provider, if you send an email out, you will get your open rates and click through rates. The way that email open rates are calculated is that in your email somewhere, there is a little hidden image. And that hidden one pixel image, when it loads, I know that you've opened the email. And I also know your location because I get your IP address. So things like MailChimp and all those many email service providers will record that. What Apple is saying, look, you didn't ask for that. You didn't ask as a user for that data to be exposed. Therefore, anyone that's using Apple Mail, we are no longer going to expose that data. So what you might think is that means that your open rates will be lower because you're not going to see anyone opening your emails. Not actually true. What happens is that um, essentially Apple loads that image for everyone automatically. They kind of cache it in the background. So it looks like everyone that's got Apple Mail of any type that you send your email through has opened it even though they might not have done. So if you've suddenly recently see your open rates go up and you've been very pleased with yourself and you've reported to your team, look how brilliant our emails are, I'm afraid it might be this change in iOS. Um, and we're seeing changes in, in privacy elsewhere as well. So this is um, something that we're seeing in Safari and Google are gonna be doing in the future as well. And that is blocking third party cookies. So just to give this some context. If I go to your website, you can set a cookie on my machine and that's a first party cookie because I've been to your website. You're the first party setting the cookie. However, if I go to a website like the Daily Mail, uh, there might be 150 different ad networks placing ads on um, in front of me and cookieing me. Those are those third party cookies. And a lot of people are unhappy about them being tracked by things that I didn't necessarily directly opt in for as well. Um, I put a link onto the page. We, we wrote a big review of this at the end of 2021. So far, really, already starting to block these. Um, we're starting to see this happening in um, Google Chrome in about, we think, about 18 months' time as well. It's why lots of us have got ad blockers. People are more aware of privacy. What does that mean to marketers? It means two things. It means that, one, on things like Google Ads and Facebook Ads, we are not going to have as many targeting options at the moment. That will be replaced by uh, machine learning, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But it also means that because people are more aware of privacy, we need to be more careful about these things. So there's definitely a bit of a kind of trend going on with this. Um, and that's combined with this concern about privacy, but also about we're seeing more AI in marketing starting to appear. So what I've basically got here is a little screenshot from a great website called Generated Faces. Generated Faces, if you need a screenshot of someone that's a particular uh, age, gender, ethnicity, you might not have appropriate uh, stock photography. If you go to this website, I can put those details in and there are nearly 3 million faces I can select from. Um, the thing is, none of these people exist. They are all computer generated faces. So, you know, there's this concern about trust going on data. We're starting to see more of this, this kind of stuff, you know, where actually I'm showing you a face of someone, but that person doesn't really exist. So this is descriptive. 
And uh, this is a fantastic tool that allows you to edit audio and video uh, really easily. But essentially, um, I can go in here, I can upload my podcast, my video audio, and it will automatically transcribe that for me. So that's, that's phenomenally useful already. And I can go in and I can go and get that transcription and use that for things like YouTube and so on. But what it also does is it allows me to edit the audio by editing the text. So essentially, I can go in and I could, maybe I said something stupid in the podcast and I want to edit it out. I just select that, hit delete, and it will edit it out and seamlessly put that audio back together. Now, that's pretty clever. The amazing thing about this is that because it's got hundreds of hours of my voice, it learns my voice. If I forget to say something, I can type it in and it's a feature called overdub and it will automatically say it in my voice. I can basically deep fake myself um, almost immediately in real time. You can download this. There's a free version of this that you can, you can download. This is Descript.com. Um, so we're starting to see concerns about privacy, more artificial intelligence in digital marketing, the ability to deep fake, which makes people think, well, can I really believe anything um, that I'm seeing? So what does all this mean? You know, we can't have third party cookies. We need to focus on owning our relationships. That means get people to our website so we can set a cookie direct. We need to think about building community. So we, we own that relationship, but it's a two-way relationship as well. So what does that kind of mean in practice? Well, we want to get back to basics to some extent. So there is this in increasing awareness of, of kind of ethics, and there are suspicions of brand. And actually, a study that the CIM did recently kind of shows that actually people are more aware of this. So if I go through and I'm logged into Google, I go to ads settings in Google, it will tell me everything that Google knows about me. So for example, which websites I've been on, what it knows about my demographic, what I've got an interest in and so on as well. And, and what people are realizing is they're kind of seeing privacy as currency. I'll give you some data, but you need to give me something in exchange for that. And if you're gonna have that data, you really need to use it in a trustworthy way. And I'm really gonna judge you on that. And what we're seeing is people are punishing brands for not using that data effectively. And a study the CIM did said, look, up to 70% of people are boycotting, avoiding, or punishing brands. So let's combine these things. Removal of cookies, um, increasing AI, and we're not sure if we can trust what we see in here as well. So we need to build that community so that we own that relationship. So a really simple example. We decided, okay, how can we embrace this? Well, let's go back to basics. We're gonna go back to email, but we're gonna do it better. So we said, okay, Subscribe to our email newsletter and we'll send you three tools, tips or techniques every month. But we will never try and send you an ad and we'll never try and sell you anything. And actually, if you reply to this, it will come directly into my inbox. Now, that means I get thousands of emails every time we send out a newsletter. But I have a team that will help me then manage that and we will reply to all of those people. So bearing in mind that the average open rates for an email um, are about 20 to 22% and the average click-through rates are about two and a half percent. How does this email perform? Because you can see there's nothing particularly beautiful about it. Well, the open rate's 46, 47%, which is great. Uh, and then the click-through rate here is 24.3%, not the click rate, the click-through rate. Okay, So that's off the charts compared to average 2.6, just by thinking about how we can own that relationship. But the point being is that you can reply. Now, Every email, I put a question at the bottom and I ask my audience something. And every time 16% of people thereabouts answer that question directly with these really long answers. That's a lot of email for me to deal with, but it's a huge opportunity. I am speaking to my customers. I am finding out what their needs and challenges are. And we adjust our products. We adjust our marketing campaigns based on that data. So really important for us to be able to do that. Another thing we've done recently is this. We do this podcast and for ages people have been saying, why don't you do a video version? And as you can see, we have got faces that are very much designed for radio. Um, but we said, okay, we'll, we'll try it out. Now, the idea of this is that I, I live in Jersey in the Channel Islands. So I'm sitting there, Kieran is on the Isle of Wight, and we all normally record in the two separate places. Um, in this case, we use the tool called riverside.fm, and that allows us to record good quality audio and video in each location, and then it combines those things together. And you think, well, why would someone want to watch a podcast? And actually, in these videos, we edit nothing out. 
So we literally just go through and leave all the bloopers in and all the things we mess up and we fall over on. But they get thousands and thousands of views because it makes that personal connection. It humanizes the brand. It gets people to kind of know us. Um, so that community building, the humanization of the brand, who are my advocates internally that I can use? You are 10 times more likely to engage with an individual than a brand. So if you're using LinkedIn, then it's fine having your brand on there, but actually I want to have individuals in there. If I'm on Twitter, it's fine having my brand on Twitter, but actually having individuals in my organization sharing things can be really powerful as well. So really thinking about how I can build that community. So let's, let's move on to some other things that we need to be aware of. Um, changes, GA4, the new version of Google Analytics. The current version that everyone's using is Universal Analytics. Um, the new version is GA4. Eventually, everyone will have to move to GA4. But don't worry, it's going to be a good 18 months at least before that, that starts to be something you need to start thinking about. What I would recommend actually at the moment is that Universal Analytics and GA4 both have their own bit of code that needs to go onto every page of your website. You can have both running at the same time. What you'll notice if you do this is that actually GA4 is a very different beast to Universal Analytics that we're all probably more used to. Just to clarify the main difference, the main difference in Universal Analytics is that it looks at pages loading. Whereas actually the um, GA4 looks at things happening within pages as well. So essentially, um, I can see you scrolling in a page, I can see you playing a video, all those different kinds of things as well. So um, look at maybe setting that up, having it on your website. I wouldn't move from one to the other yet because they're showing slightly different results still. So it's kind of worth bearing in mind. Um, there may be that difference in the data, but get it up and running and then you're going to have historical data in there as well. The Advertising Standards Agency and um, the IAB and various other bodies are moving to regulate influencer marketing more. And this was a study saying that 76% of Instagram influencers are hiding advertising disclosure. So the bit where you have to put hashtag ad, what they're actually doing is going through and putting in um, all their normal hashtags and then hiding the hashtag ad in there. And that's legally compliant currently but it is not necessarily compliant with the spirit of the laws that are in place as well. So we are going to see some more regulations. So just, just be aware of that, because one of the things we're concerned about is that if the law changes and you're working with an influencer, does that apply to their previous posts? So if they, if they breach these new rules in a previous post, you need to get that post revised or taken down. So um, keep a lookout for, for those things. And obviously the CIM will be reporting on, on all of those all the time as well. Um, conversational design. Well, if you're anything like 97% of us, when you go through to a website and that chatbot comes up uh, and it says, hi, can I help? You probably think, no, no, you can't. You're actually really irritating. Um, conversational design is there to try and improve the functionality of chatbots. So it's that whole piece about um, trying to be more of a diagnostic tool. So rather than just coming and saying, hi, can I help? Saying, well, I know what you've done on my website previously. I know what products you've got, so I'm going to offer you some options. And the likes of um, Salesforce and HubSpot um, will allow you to do this. So you can see an example here. We've, we've got a chat flow in HubSpot where we can sequence through um, a load of chat interactions. At the moment, it's all, you know, very bottom right-hand side of the screen. You can make this front and center of the experience. So rather than navigating through menus like you do on a website as normal, thinking about how actually I could use these conversations and I to make it a diagnostic tool uh, within my website to, to go through and actually understand my audiences. And if you look at the likes of ASOS and Pretty Little Thing, they're doing a, a really good job of doing this in many cases as well. Now, this isn't artificial intelligence. That, that's just clever scripting. But what we are seeing artificial intelligence more and more of is this. This is in Google Ads. You'll see this in Facebook as well. When you go and build a campaign, Rather than it going through and saying, set your targeting options, it's automatically selected automatic targeting. And it says generally automated targeting can improve campaign performance by up to 20%. So they're basically using machine learning to target your ads and increasing the build of ads as well. You, know, you give them 10 different headlines, 10 different sets of copy. They're going to mix them up, set out different versions. This is great. Uh, however, it means that the performance of your campaigns may gradually improve over time as the machine learning algorithm learns. And don't assume this is going to be better than manual targeting. You might actually want to go through, run a manually targeted campaign, see what results you get. 
then you would go through and run a um, automatic targeted campaign and see what results you get and then compare the two and see which is giving you the better return on investment so you need to look at visibility you need to look at click through and then you need to look at what happens in your analytics afterwards as well but just bear in mind that some of these campaigns we're seeing results where it takes a couple of months for the campaign to really start running properly because the machine learning needs that level of data to actually go through and improve things but don't always assume it will do a better job than manual targeting but test it out and, and find out and this kind of brings us on to this this whole kind of idea of of analytics analysis so it's all very well you know us having analytics and maybe having ga4 and so on but it's really easy to misrepresent that data so um i've just got a a, a mock-up here of uh, a client's website and we went and spoke to them they're a bank and they said look we, 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 we want to do more content marketing we did a load of content marketing training with them and they essentially embraced content marketing they said it's brilliant ever since we've embraced content marketing we redesigned the website people are now staying three times longer which which sounds all right um the reality when we looked at the stat was quite different so what was actually happening people were coming through to the website and they're waiting about five seconds the page to load and they were clicking log into personal banking on the top right hand side of the screen then what happened is they redesigned the website and they moved that login button from the top right to left hand side of the screen what now happens people come in they wait about five seconds or so uh, for the page to load uh, and then they spend 10 seconds saying where's the button gone and eventually they click through uh, and they log into personal banking that's it so my visit's gone from five to 15 seconds. My analytics says I have a 300% visit duration. And I think, brilliant, people are staying three times longer. But in reality, I've just annoyed my customers for 10 seconds. So this ability to analyze analytics, paint a picture with it, um, is really, really important. And it's it, the big missing skill that our skills benchmark tells us that is, is kind of going on at the moment. And I'll talk about that skills benchmark in a moment. And actually you can benchmark yourself for free you can benchmark your team um, for free as well also what we're seeing is day rates for people that can do this are going through the roof so from a career point of view this is a great opportunity but it should be as marketers we're looking at data we're drawing some sort of uh, inference from that data i think this needs changing well, i could do this differently we then change something and then we look at the data again as opposed to just going through and um you know, holding up a chart once a month and said, look, things are going up. We really need to do that analytics analysis uh, a bit more. Now, with all of these things, we, we get quite reliant on analytics. And actually what we need to do is go beyond analytics. Analytics tells us the, the what. It tells us what pages people have looked at. What it doesn't tell us is the why. And this is an absolutely brilliant tool. And there are lots of other tools out there that do these similar kind of things, but this is a new one. This is Microsoft Clarity. Um, if you've got Google, sorry, Bing Webmaster Tools, you can access this. You can set an account up separately as well. This goes onto my website and it essentially records people using my website. Now you need to make sure that your cookie policy uh, tells people that this is one of the cookies you'll be using and what you're using it for. People come in, it records people using this, it anonymizes those visits. And then I can go in and understand what's going on. So there's a couple of really important things here. First of all, it says dead clicks. This is people clicking on bits of the page that they can't actually click on. Now, 14% is a really high number, so we're immediately very concerned about that. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Rage clicks is people just furiously clicking on the same bit of the page again and again. That's quite low. Um, you don't want to see too much of, of that stuff. Um, so what are these dead clicks? Well, we went through. He said, why have we got so many people clicking on our page repeatedly where they can't click? And what we quickly realized is that people are going through, and we've got lots of answers to questions and definitions and things like that on our website. They were essentially going through and copying, pasting content off our website. They're really stealing our content. That's okay, because there's lots of students, lots of people studying, lots of people are building strategies that use target internet as a resource. So we think, oh, that's fine, but let's add some pop-ups to the page then. So download our complete, um, cheat sheet for this data so you don't even need to do that or if you're studying marketing why don't you sign up for this free benchmark and so on so that was one insight the other insight is that we have a page on our website that's got two options one for individuals one for teams and people are going in and it says individual teams and individuals is already pre-selected and you're on the individual version of the page people didn't realize that they thought you had to click on individuals 
So we could see that in the video. We could see how people are actually behaving. And then we could take that and improve it. So now when you click on that, it scrolls you down to, a, to the right piece of content. So it's good to have analytics. It's good to analyze it. But let's go beyond that. Let's actually see how people are interacting with the website. The other way of doing this, incidentally, is informal usability testing, which is basically get five people that represent your target audience to go through and to try and do things on your website, observe them doing that, and then just work out what they're struggling with. You can do it over Zoom, you can do it face to face. Those people shouldn't be already familiar with your website. Uh, and there's a, a great uh, study that came out um, from Imperial College and a few other places that basically said, if you do informal usability testing with five or more people, you will identify 85% of the problems with your website. And that's pretty profound. That's really important that actually only five people, not many of us do usability testing, but actually it will identify those things that are going wrong on your website a lot of the time that we're not even aware of. So definitely worth going beyond analytics and uh, maybe looking at some of these tools or doing some of that kind of testing. So with all this change, with the increasing levels of noise, with artificial intelligence, changes in cookies, new AI targeting options, what do we need to do? There's too much to think about. Take a step back to where I started this. I was thinking about that podcast. Focus on the user journey. Who is your, your audience? Split them into personas. Map out their user journey. Brilliant tool, uh, by the way, for doing that. There's a free version of it. UX Pressia. U-X-P-R-E-S-S-I-A dot com. And it allows you to build personas and user journeys and map them out really easily. And then look at where are the opportunities for improving your target audience's user journey. And, and how could you kind of go about that? What type of content is going to work and, and so on? I just wanted to leave you with this. Um, I'll give the link through to this um, before I give you some other resources in a moment. We do the Digital Marketing Skills Benchmark. We publish this uh, every year with the Chartered Institute Marketing in partnership. And it, it kind of shows where skills are and where they're progressing. Um, we test in analytics and data, content, strategy, and so on. We get people to actually test their skills using a load of questions, multiple choice questions, and see what they know and what they don't know. We've had over 7,000 people globally go through and do this now. So it's very, very rigorous data. The outer edges of the circle represent 100%. And you can see there's this blue bit in the middle. That basically represents um, how well people's skills are. And, you know, we don't expect it to be 100%. But you would hope it to, to progress um, on, a, on a kind of yearly basis. What we've actually seen is that what's happened in the last two years is that Technology continues to move at pace and actually it's accelerating because of more and more people moving online because of the pandemic. But we haven't been going to conferences. We haven't been attending as many courses, haven't as many things like this, unfortunately. Skills have actually gone backwards and the areas they've gone backwards the most are analytics and data and content marketing. There has been a bit of improvement in email marketing, maybe because we're over relying on it. And maybe general marketing, we've gone back to basics a bit, the, the, the fundamentals of marketing. But what this means is that we have got a skills crisis um, within digital marketing as well. And it's great to see you know, huge amounts of you here today on, on these kind of events. And it's great that CI and are kind of organizing these events because we all need to commit to lifelong learning. And this is going to continue to change at pace um, as well. So if you're interested in the, the, the skills um, and the things, well, you can download the report for free. There's no email sign up uh, or anything like that. You can actually go through and benchmark your own skills um, if you want to as well. So first of all, every website that I've mentioned today, um, if you go through to Digital Marketing Talk, you just Google that, it will be number one uh, in Google. And we update that every two or three months. And it's got every tool I've mentioned and a load of others in there as well. It doesn't aim to be a definitive list, but it is a list of what we think are the best free tools uh, that are out there. And it's broken down into categories. So if you want search, um, keyword research tools, social media monitoring tools, all those kind of things all in there. If you want to benchmark your own skills, if you've got a team of up to 30 people, so we're only doing this on a very limited basis, you can go in, register on there, you can do it automatically as an individual. If there's a team, it will, will send out the details so your team can log in to do that, and you'll get back a report on where your skills are. We'll do that anonymously. We're not going to share it with your boss. Uh, don't worry. Um, but you can see where your skills stand at the moment, and it will make some recommendations for free content that, that may be useful. Um, for you as well. So go in and do that. You can also go there and download the whole report. So there's some really great stuff in there. Uh, Gemma Butler, who's the marketing director at Chart Institute Marketing, has written some stuff for us as well. 
um, and there's really big analysis into industry by industry, what's happening, where the strengths and weaknesses are and how that's trending um, over recent time as well. Um, that's it in terms of uh, content for me. You've got the, the, the um, toolkit, you've got the, the benchmark. Uh, if you're on the podcast, it's on the, on the page as well. But if you want to get in contact afterwards, uh, it's just Daniel Rolls on LinkedIn and you're very welcome to connect up there. Daniel Rolls, one word, on Twitter uh, and Target Internet is me on Instagram. I'm really happy to connect in those, those places and have any further conversations uh, as well. So um, it's now time. Uh, if there's any questions, so if you've got any questions, then uh, please do put those in and Phil will take those and uh, talk me through them. So what have we got, Phil? Okay, um, that was brilliant. Thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, it was a great presentation again. And uh, to say we'll be hearing from our second guest speaker, Anne Stanley, shortly. Um, we've already got some questions lined up. So thank you very much if you've already posted. And we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next 10 to 15 minutes or so. Okay, Daniel, are you ready for this? Um, these are going to come at you in sort of chronological order, I think, to begin with. So how can we deal effectively with the email click-through rate issue with Apple email, someone has asked? So just to clarify with that, it's, it only impacts open rate. So your click-through rate will still be accurate. It means you just have to accept that the open rate is not going to be accurate, but we set again its new benchmark. So what I mean is that it's going to skew upwards, but then we just compare apples to apples. So we basically go, okay, it's this level at the moment, let's try new subject lines, let's try new times of day, and let's try and make sure that we, we improve that. So um, there's, there's not much we can do other than being aware of it and then using that as our new benchmark level. If you're trying to see the average benchmarks, if you search MailChimp open rates, they've got a great report that they do regularly that will give us what those averages are and we can benchmark ourselves against that. Great, thanks, uh, that's really useful. Um, a specific question about Riverside. Um, I work in internal comms and I'm starting podcasts with management. I think Riverside would be great, but is there a way to take out mistakes? Yeah, so what, what you get with um, Riverside FM, or basically I'm sitting somewhere, someone's sitting somewhere else. If I've got a decent microphone and a decent camera, it will record at my end and the other end, it combines those, but it actually gives you separate tracks and it actually gives you an editor as well. So you can either download those tracks and edit them in um, something like GarageBand or the audio, or you could go through and use Final Cut to do the video, but there are some basic tools built into it. The other thing it does is it's quite nice is you can take excerpts of those videos and you can use them for social posts. So it means it gives you something you can kind of um, internally or externally, you could share little clips to try and get people engaged as well. So um, yeah, it does give you those editing options and you can take mistakes out. And that's the nice thing. What we need to say to people is look, we're gonna record this, no pressure, you get it wrong, no problem at all, we'll edit it out, our job is to make you look good. Um, and you put people at ease and it means they're more likely to kind of to get, to get engaged as well. One thing I would say though is because you're using video as well, two things to think about. One is the webcam that's in your computer is probably not up to it. So the, the camera I've got up here um, is a full HD 60 frames per second kind of thing. And also um, the audio quality, you want you know, maybe a decent microphone. This is a Yeti Blue, which is quite a nice quality microphone. If you combine those things, it will just up the production quality a little bit and they'll just plug both directly into your, into your laptop as well. Okay, great, really useful tips. Thanks for that. Um, so there's a question around the email campaign you mentioned at the start of the presentation, I think. Can you give an example of what a question to your list looks like in an email that gets response? Any general tips yeah, so, for that? Yeah, so what we do, we put in, first of all, there's a link, an intro that says, this is what we're doing. This is what we're up to at the moment, literally a paragraph. Then there's three things, tips, tools, techniques. And then there's this literally a simple question at the bottom. And it says, uh, what marketing books are you reading at the moment? Because books are always out of date. Any, anything good? good? Or what, what's the one marketing thing you're struggling with at the moment? Or um, if you're not a paying customer of ours, why not? What, what, what is it about your product I don't like? Um, so we're, we're, we're answering quite, you know, quite open questions sometimes. And about 16% of the audience will reply in depth. I mean, I get paragraph after paragraph of responses. So by making it really clear, the tone of voice of the email is from me. And if you reply to it, it will come directly to my inbox. And combining that with having a podcast and video and things like that, so people feel a more personal connection, it has a huge impact. Now, if you're gonna do this in a really big brand, you would probably have a number of different brand ambassadors um, and you need some way of managing the volume of emails and things that come back. But a lot of people say, well, we can't do that. We're a big brand, there's too many emails we come back. 
when you think too many of our, our customers are speaking to us, that's it. We need to readjust our, our thinking, I think. So um, big opportunity, but you know, just what are, their, what are their challenges? Not really about our product, but more about their challenges. That seems to work pretty effectively. And people are happy to share, and then we can shape our marketing to help them solve those. Okay, great. Um, I just noticed that there's a few questions people asking, can you say again the name, various websites and tools, etc. But I guess the thing to do really is to download the handout um, from today's session, but also to go to the Digital Marketing Toolkit. Everything you mentioned is, is included in that, isn't it, yeah. Daniel? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you just Google Digital Marketing Toolkit, it will be number one in Google. It's a PDF download and it's got everything in there as well. Um, the ones that people always love are Descript, Dot com which is the audio editing one um generated faces so that yeah there's a load in there so yeah if you get that toolkit you'll find them all and they're all in the slides from today as well so you can you can download that under the handouts as well great um just returning to the subject of click through so um yesterday we were told how click through rates are not necessarily a useful metric to measure mm. what are your thoughts on this and what metrics would you prioritize as most valuable to analyze yeah, so click through is a funny one because we obsess with click through rate, but the reality is just because someone clicks doesn't mean they'll do anything. What I would always work down to is I set goals up in analytics. So a goal is you know people doing the thing I want them to do, filling in the form, buying the product, staying a certain duration of time. Once I've done that, um, I've got reports in Google Analytics like multi-channel funnels. Multi-channel funnels is a form of attribution modeling. And what I suddenly get is, look, I can see how many people actually did the thing I wanted them to do, but actually, what are all the steps in their journey? Because, for example, you might get a click from Facebook, you might then get four Google searches, then two direct visits where I've already bookmarked you, and then I fill that form in. Well, I need to know that Facebook was at the beginning was part of that journey. So I would always come back to set goals up within analytics and then look at attribution modeling. And multi-channel funnels is quite a nice, easy way of, of doing that. It's a report that allows you to see that anyone that ended up doing the thing that I wanted them to do, what channels did they use on the way there? Um, I don't really care about the order they were in. I just, I can look at that, but I want to see, you know, how much did email contribute? How much did social media contribute? And then I can start to work out the value that channel is actually providing. Great. Okay. Um, going on to the subject of influencers now. So do the ASA regulations apply to influencers you might work with that are based outside of the UK? It's, it's basically down to the fact that if you are a UK brand, your brand is regulated by it. So um, essentially, if you are partnering with a brand, what they're saying is it's not just the influence that's responsible, it's actually the brand that's gonna be responsible as well. So if that influencer is in Dubai and the law didn't apply to them, then they're not responsible, but your brand will be. Um, I think also just from a point of view of best practice, you know, it's good to do this. So it's just saying, look, you, you need to put that hashtag ad in. You can't hide it away. It needs to be really clear um, where that is and so on as well. So just be careful of that because that's a bit of a change where the brand starts being responsible. The law's not in place yet. We haven't had clarification yet, but that's as we understand where it's going to change to. Yeah, it's becoming a bit of a hot topic, this one, isn't it? So um, you, you mentioned the statistic around, I think it was when you were doing um, the user testing, um, mm -hmm. you had five subjects, um, you, you'd uncover 85% of all the things that were going wrong. Somebody's yeah. asked what was the source of that, uh, that research? So there's Imperial, a, wasn't it? yeah, there's a big study that Imperial College did. Um, there's actually been uh, three or four as well from the US. It, it just kind of shows this lovely chart that basically says, look, how many test users have you got? What percentage of the problems you identify? And it goes up pretty steeply when you get up past about four or five users. And then it creeps up gradually after that. I think the point of it is more than anything else is that you, you don't need a huge amount of people testing a website. Now, when I say testing, if we think about what the definition of usability is, um, it's looking at a specified person trying to achieve a specified goal in a specified context. So your, your specified um, person is your particular target audience. The goal is like try and do something on our website and the context is kind of giving them some context to why they're doing it. Then what you're testing is um, could they, the effectiveness, the efficiency, and the satisfaction. And I'm glad I've remembered that definition. Um, and basically saying, can they do it? How quickly could they do it? Did they like doing it? So you then go through and say, right, try and go, you know, imagine you're in this scenario, try and go and do this on our website. And then you watch them doing, you make observations of where they go wrong and so on as well. 
Uh, and then he said, could they do it? Yes, they did it in a reasonable period of time. How long did it take? Well, let's time them. Let's look for any outliers. And then ask them, did you like that? Was that good? And they'll give you some feedback. If you do that enough times, maybe it's five times, maybe it's 20 times, you will start to tease out, why is everyone on the website doing that? Uh, you'll start to see that they're they're doing things in a particular way. You go, oh, we need to fix that. So it was like our button that everyone was clicking on that didn't do everything. Um, it was really important that we kind of replace that and fix it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so here's a question around GA4. Um, does GA4 incorporate some of the tag manager's capabilities like track events, such as video views and scrolling? Yeah, it does. So, I mean, I would still recommend using tag manager to put in the, um, the, the the analytics code because you've still got that flexibility. But we, we actually had events within universal analytics, but it meant you had to add extra code. So quite often we'd use tag manager for adding that, that extra code in. Um, in reality, the, the main thing that, that GA4 is doing differently is looking within the page. So things like watching videos and scrolling and clicking on PDFs automatically generate events now. So a lot of that just is there automatically. So I can not only see what page is looking at, I can see, oh, you scrolled and you watched the video and you stayed for a certain period of time. Um, it also fixes the problem with visit duration. Generally speaking, Universal Analytics, the last page you're on, it doesn't record the time that you're on that page for. It discounts it. So it, it, it leads to quite inaccurate measurement of time. So it improves that as well. So it does fix some real fundamental flaws. The problem is at the moment, it's quite a different product. It's missing a load of stuff that's in universal analytics and it's got a lot of stuff that's very different. So there's a bit of a learning curve. It's going to, it's going to go with that as well. Okay. So here's a big question for you. What do you think the future looks like for digital marketing based on your insights? Do you think there will be any new trends? Hmm. What, what we're seeing, I mean, there's a emergence of technologies. So first of all, fragmentation of social media. We are seeing more and more people on multiple platforms, not just one easy one to get to with them as well. We're starting to see um, shift away from the major platforms. So fragmentation is one thing we're seeing as well. Um, the, the AI thing is, is kind of appearing everywhere. So the whole machine learning. So I, I don't mean like conversational, you know, chatting to AIs, but I mean the fact of, you know, AI based targeting of ads, algorithms that learn. Um, websites that are basically giving me content that's personalized to me based on that machine learning. So what we're seeing is a trend towards is that when people join their data up, they can then use machine learning for completely automating the experience that people have. I get the right ads at the right time. The content on the website is adjusted to me. The chatbots are talking about the right things. So actually more algorithm based marketing. There's also a risk with that is that we just assume everyone fits into the algorithm and we start giving people the wrong stuff but th there'll be a lot of movement into that algorithm based stuff. Um, there's lots of discussion at the moment about, you know, about the metaverse because of what Facebook have done. Um, yes, but not yet. I think we're a bit um, ahead of things. You're gonna see lots of um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens um, coming into marketing. Um, why? Well, collectibles, first of all, but also privacy. So if you think, if you can put all of your privacy into something and then prove that you own it, and then you can take that with you from website to website, but no one else can kind of steal it. There's, there's some things you'll probably that will get quite interesting. But I think both of those are in the further future. They're, they're not quite mainstream yet. But yeah, basically algorithm-based marketing um, and an awful lot more fragmentation and more noise and the skills gap getting worse because all this stuff is accelerating so quickly. Those marketers that can really stay up to date and commit to lifelong learning are those that are really going to stand out and succeed. Okay. Um, and there's a quite a few questions actually from viewers around the skills gap um so i guess to generalize you know what would you rec how would you recommend that people um upgrade their skills that, that is uh, apart from taking your courses and reading your books daniel yeah I, I think there's we all learn in different ways and i think it's, it's absolutely fine to accept that some people watch videos some people read um reading you know books is a challenge because they're generally out of date by the time they're, they're published which is why we keep having to do new editions of things but I would say find your format of learning, whether that's podcast, video or anything else, but fit it into your week. It has to be a commitment to ongoing learning. So um, I like podcasts because I can listen to them while I'm doing something else, which is why our podcast works well for us as well. Um, but, but also think about different types of interactions and then building it into organizations. So like things like e-learning, people can do in their own time. Um, one of the things we do with Target Internet is that we'll go into organizations and say, how do we encourage the uptake of that online learning? 
So it's things like, right, we'll get, get everyone going to do this bit of e-learning and we're going to do a lunch and learn on Wednesday. And we're all going to get together on a Zoom call and talk about what we learned and what we liked and what we didn't like. So it's, it's just having all those different interventions in place um, and committing to that as part of your week. It has to be diarized. If it's not in your diary, it will get pushed. And you have to protect that time in your diary. So, so it's a really hard thing to do, especially when we have like back-to-back -back Zoom calls now. But I mean, the fact that all of you are here on an event like this shows that <clears throat> these are the people that are committing to learning. So I really, really encourage that and implore it. Okay, um, we have really just run out of time for questions. I've got just going to ask you one more, and then we'll have to move on to Anne's presentation. Um, so, final question: How do you calculate and prioritise which areas in marketing need the most improvement? So, this idea of marketing channel mix, and I'll try and keep this brief. Yeah, how much Facebook, how much Google, how much this, how much that? There is no right answer. And it's different for every organization, for every client, in, and it changes over time as our use of channel adjusts. So what you need is a measurement dashboard that basically says, what are we measuring for each channel, but how much is that channel contributing? And we can work that out by looking at that attribution modeling, like multi-channel funnels. So I would look at that and go, right, email's not contributing much. Can we improve it? Try all the different things. If it still doesn't work, maybe that's not the area to focus on. We're particularly guilty of this with social. Like we, we just focus all the effort on social. It doesn't really give us results, but we carry on doing it. So I think take an attribution modeling basis to this. And if you can build a dashboard, um, if you search digital strategy measurement framework, the digital strategy measurement framework, we've got a step-by-step -step blog on this. It will be number one in Google, and it will talk you through how to build a dashboard. So digital strategy measurement framework and that will answer that in detail and give you all the things that i haven't got time to go into now that's brilliant um thank you so much daniel some some really great questions from our viewers and some real great answers and hot tips for you as well don't forget that you can download the free marketing toolkit from the target internet website as well okay so let's let, so let's move on to our next guest speaker Anne stanley from annika digital so when you're ready Anne, it's over to you Hi everybody, uh, it's great to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is what's new in search engine marketing. Um, I've covered some of the basics, but I have dived into some of the aspects in a little bit more detail. It's great to follow Daniel because some of the things he was talking about overlap with what I was gonna talk about as well. Um, but what I thought we'd do to start with is we'd do a couple of polls to try and get an understanding of the level of knowledge within the room. So um, we're going to do the first poll. Um, are you or your organization undertaking search marketing? That is SEO or PPC. Most of us know, as, know of that. And um, you can actually tick more than one answer because some people will be doing it themselves and they'll have an agency as well. So uh, interesting. Yes, so about 46% of the people, either them or their team, are responsible um, for um, SEO and PPC. About 20% of you aren't actually doing it in your current organization. And then 27% are, um, it's someone else's responsibility. Um, and then there's a few of you that are um, actually outsourcing this, which is, is, which is quite common. And then a few of you are doing it for um, uh, other people. Excellent. So my next question is, uh, my next poll is, what's your current knowledge of SEO? So, um, and this is just about SEO because more of the slides are about SEO. So that's really interesting. 72% just have a basic understanding. 34% uh, are responsible for writing content. That's good. 23% uh, are involved in the technical aspects. Now that, the last one's most surprising. Um, I guess digital PR is a new and up and coming um, a, a sort of field um, but um, there is more and more of an integration between SEO and um, P, uh, PR particularly digital PR um, as we know that links are becoming more and more important to actually get your site optimized okay so my name is Anne Stanley I'm the founder and a chief executive or CEO of Annika Digital um, I've actually been in digital marketing for um, 20 years this year and it's also Annika's 15th birthday this month. So we've got a big party tomorrow. So we're going to be celebrating 15 years. Um, interestingly, there's not that many digital marketing agencies that have been uh, around for more than about 10 years. So um, Annika is, as I said, was founded in 2007. Um, there's 27 of us and we have about 45 clients. 
most of the clients that we work with are um, about two thirds of the B2B, but we also do a lot of work in science and manufacturing. And we do a mix of e-commerce and lead generation. Um, and we work with some quite well-known brands like Experian, uh, Palex, Dykeman Shoes. So it's quite a mix. Um, and um, what we have done is we've tried to, um, for our 15th birthday, we've identified the four sectors that we mainly work in, which is around construction, uh, STEM, local. We do a lot of training. We've um, just... Um, launched a, a three-month training course with in the East Midlands, which has been free for the majority of people for over 100 learners. So we are doing quite a lot of tender work with the local LEPs and Chamber of Commerce. And we're also doing a lot of work around manufacturing as well. So that's e-commerce. So what I'm going to cover today is I'm going to do a quick reminder of the key digital marketing channels. Um, I know that there's a few students in, in the room and some of you may not be aware of this. So this is just a sort of an acronym that you can use to remind you. Um, I then got, um, we also use similar web. We've got a paid version of similar web. I really recommend it, but it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable investment every month for the paid version. But it's brilliant at doing sort of industry research to find out what drives website traffic for different sectors. So I've got some examples there. Um, I'm also going to show, um, I've, I've got a slide from my 2018 uh, presentation I did at Duxford and I'm going to put exactly the same uh, search in and just show you how much things have changed over the last, um, well, over the last four years. And um, I'm also going to do the same search in some of the other search engines. So uh, Daniel mentioned DuckDuckGo, but also you've got Yahoo and Bing. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how search engines work. So I'm just going to um, mainly focus on SEO from this perspective. And I'm not going to try and teach you all to suck eggs. But what I did want to do is by just explaining the basics of that, I could then go through the main algorithm changes that happened in 2021 and what we're expecting to happen in 2022. Um, I've also got a couple of tools in there. So, for example, uh, there is um, something that allows you to check your mobile speed and um, page experience. And I've got a, a URL that you can just go and run it and, and see how you're getting on. Um, and that's going to be really important because it's now going to apply in the future to desktops as well. Um, I'm going to do a little bit on the growth in paid advertising and how those results have changed um, and what's been going on with that. And then um, I know that Dan did quite a lot on tracking and analytics, but um, you may have read in the news um, that the EU has, um, well, attempted to ban Google Analytics for privacy issues. So I just want to, want to bring you up to date with um, what's happening with that and also what's happening with some of the tracking um, of ads that um, we, we talk, uh, Dan talked a lot about Apple, but of course, uh, things are moving in in Google's world as well. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to bring up um, an acronym that we use and we call it POET. So um, this is quite a good slide for you to use as a sort of a, a memoir of some of the many channels that we actually use um, in digital marketing. So paid is um, everything that you have to pay for. Owned is the stuff that you do yourself. So this is the stuff that you control, your content, your emails. I mean, you can add um, webinars and podcasts on there. Uh, we actually run a webinar every Friday morning. And uh, that's how, in the same way that Dan was describing, he uses podcasts. Uh, we use webinars as our route to market. And I've got um, the schedule for the next uh, couple of months to share with you later. Uh, then you've got the earned media, which definitely started off very much in PR world. But if you think about something like social media where you're you you know you are reliant often on other people sharing your content it's it's sometimes the most difficult bit it's also the part that's most likely to cause problems both um, from a point of view of lack of control um, but it, if it works well um, you can get viral spread of your content um, and you know that's ideally what everybody wants uh, and then I've just added, um, we've added an extra um, one into this, which is called technical. Um, it makes it very easy to remember because everybody can remember poet. Um, but the reason we've added this is, is because, um, as you saw with some of the stuff that Dan was doing, Daniel was doing, you know, you can't really do advertising and marketing without having a really good understanding of analytics, tracking, 
um, use of things like Google Data Studio for data visualization and dashboards, UX and conversion rate optimization. These are all the stuff which um, you know overlaps with your web developer, but web developers are often not that good at this. And so it's sort of almost is a bridge between marketing and what the web developer does. And it's, and it's a really um, sought after skill. Uh, there's a lack of people that understand this and um, it's an area where um, you know you often have to train people up that maybe are doing paid ads to be able to do some of this stuff because it's an essential part of what you need to do to actually manage um, your marketing. The other half of this is some of the newer technologies such as voice search, AI, machine learning, internet, API and product feeds. But also um, we, what I haven't mentioned is things like if you look at something like Spotify, which I know has been in the news a lot recently, uh, they use almost like a programmatic way of finding their audiences in the same way that um, Sky's AdSmart works on a similar basis where you're actually choosing the audience uh, rather than having the run of a, of a program or of a channel. So um, things have definitely moved. So a lot of the um, types of advertising that previously we, we would have called traditional has now sort of over, now overlaps with the digital world and they're now converging. Um, so when you look at something like SimilarWeb, I've chosen three examples here. So I've chosen Home and Garden, which is, um, I think there's about 50 websites of all different sizes. Some of them are quite well known. So you've got things like John Lewis in there, Wayfair, but then you've got a lot of smaller ones in this um, bespoke group that I made. And what you'll notice is that when you've got a, um, a lot of well-known brands, you get a lot of direct traffic and you also get a lot of organic search. And that's because a lot of people are actually searching for the brand rather than typing in um, Wayfair you know, directly into the uh, browser. You also get in e-commerce land um, a lot of paid search. And the reason is, is that when people are trying to shop for products, they, the first thing they probably do is either go to Amazon or go to Google and do a search. Get a heck of a lot, a, a lot of, um, of paid search um, in e-commerce, and what surprises most of people is just how low some of these other um, channels are. So you can see that most of these are under two percent, um, and that is actually quite common. You do get some exceptions. If you if I go, uh, we've got over 150, maybe slightly more than that, analytics accounts linked to ourselves, and with the exception of the ones that are spending a lot of money on paid social, um, particularly Facebook and Instagram ads, um, we actually find that um, you know most of the advertising is happening when they're in uh, the platform and they don't really utilize clicks or conversion ads, which get them over to the website. So the traffic going um, over to your website from social tends to be uh, very low. Um, if you compare that with doors and windows, which is things like Everest and then your local UBPC window supply, what you can see here is there's not so many big brands, so you don't get quite as many um, direct searches. And as a result there, you get a lot more organic search and you get a lot more paid search. Now, this is going to be a combination of product phrases and service pr um, phrases as well as uh, brand phrases. But you can see that um, when you've got a mix of e-commerce and you've got you know, the local uh, window fitter, who um, you know nobody really knows apart from in that local area, uh, then it, it tends not to be direct traffic. It tends to be uh, mainly search traffic. The next one I chose was solicitors. Now, th this is an interesting one for a slightly different reason. Again, this was a big, um, you know, people like Gordon Slater, Erwin uh, Mitchell, but also a load of local. And of course, most solicitors have been around for literally you know, tens of years or even hundreds of years. So a lot of them have got very high brand awareness. So you do get quite high levels of direct traffic and you also get very high levels of organic search. Now, what you'll notice in this one is the paid search is much, much lower. And I think the reason for this is because um, in the cases of solicitor phrases, the cost per click can be prohibitively expensive. So there's a bit of a reluctance to be spending sort of five, 15, 30 pounds a click, depending on the type of service for these phrases. So this is an area where, to be honest, if you are a your solicitor or some of these lead generation sites, there's often quite some quite good opportunities 
because it's not saturated, even though it might be quite competitive and therefore quite expensive. One of the other things I wanted to show you was the evolution of the search results. And um, this is um, first slide is taken from 2018 where I present, I've had presented a couple of times at, at, at for the CIM, but this was my first, my first outing. Um, and this was a search for O2 phone deals. And you can see you've got um, a couple of ads on the, uh, at the top. You've got a few shopping ads on the right, both of which are coming from the Google Ads platform. And then you've got your organic results. And the thing that's interesting here is that the top organic result is actually Carphone Warehouse. And this is actually um, and that's actually a featured snippet, which tends to be a list. Now, you don't get the featured snippet unless you're in the top 10. And normally you have to deliberately change the content in a way to encourage you to get there. And um, so you can see in this case, the O2 listing is actually a bit further down. Now, if you compare with what I did last week, you'll notice, first of all, that um, there's a lot more. There's actually now four um, uh, ads and these are either text ads, but they can also be something called dynamic search ads, which is almost like a paid SEO. Um, and I think that's going to be really important going forward. Um, Google's trying to use machine learning to automate everything you do. And eventually what it's going to do is look at your site and decide um, what phrases you want to be found for rather than you going out and finding them all. Um, and so you can see in this case, particularly with the top one, which um, is got all these site links underneath, the ads are taking up nearly all of the page. You've also got your shopping ads on the right. And you can see in this case now, O2's uh, organic result is at the top. Now, what I thought I'd do is I'll show you the full, uh, a bit more of the page by making it smaller and thinner. And you can see <laughs> that the ads just go on forever on the right hand side. So again, you've got four big ads at the top, you've got all those shopping ads, and then you've got the organic results. They've started to introduce logos into the search results now. So that's an image that's taken from the site. And then also the whole of that um, top bit is O2. So in this case, the O2 brand is getting most of the um, visibility at the top of the organic results. And the um, money supermarket one in this case is pushed a bit further down. But if you go back to the previous slide, the point of this is, is that there's so many more opportunities for people to actually click um, on something else before, even though, you know, O2 at number one, as you'd expect, um, there's so many opportunities for somebody to click on something else before they scroll down. What it does mean is that the relatively click through rate of SEO is often adversely affected by everything else that's happening above it. And if I did something like O2 phone deals near me, I would probably get the map results in there as well, um, which would push it down even further. So you can see that even if you're number one in SEO, it can be very difficult to um, actually get the visibility and the click throughs. So one of the things I wanted to present uh, to you was actually Spark Toro, which Daniel mentioned. Um, he's um, Rand Fishkin um, did a study using similar web data. Uh, this is the most recent data I can find, um, but did include, um, you know, the period of the pandemic um, and the first lockdown. And the important thing about this slide is it shows that um, when people actually search on Google, a lot of the time they don't click through to another website. In fact, um, Google is providing the answer nearly, well, in this case, 46% of the time. Um, so clicking through to a, a link on the left hand side is about 50% and the paid click through rate is only about um, just under 3%. Now, this would seem to imply that there's no point in doing paid, which I would completely contest because in most cases, there's so many searches, you wouldn't be able to afford to buy all the clicks anyway. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. But what this shows is that, again, even if you're at the top of the organic search results, if Google's provided um, either um, an answer or a Wikipedia listing or something else at the top, people don't even click through to your website anymore. And it's even worse on mobile phone. Now, the reason it's so bad on mobile phones is because 
a lot of the searches on mobile are relate to local results such as you know um, accountants near me or local plumber or something like that where the map comes up and when you get into into um, your mobile the map the the google um, uh, business profile is really dominant and and often the telephone number is the first thing that's there so what will happen is is that people will actually click on the phone um, and actually call rather than go through to the website so you can see in this case the actual clicks are even lower so although we've got a situation where Google, um, sorry, more people are searching in mobile for most sectors, um, some hardcore B2B, it's still dominated by desktop, but in many, many sectors, mobile has taken over the volume. Um, although you get the searches, you're not getting the clicks. And then the next thing that happens is, is actually a lot of the time when they come to your website, they don't convert as much because it's not as easy customer journey. Um, or you know they've got to fill in a more complicated form so a lot of the, the you know and, and most of the analytics I look at the mobile is probably converting about half of that of the desktop traffic now what about other search engines then so first of all I just wanted to show you the market share so this has changed a lot since uh, April uh, 2020 which was just as the pandemic started at that point Google had 85% and then uh, that's actually gone up to 86 percent now the search volumes themselves have, have massively increased you know we're talking about in some sectors three and in other sectors 20 times more and this is because so many people have, used, have moved over to e-commerce um, so what you've seen is that google has um, has grown its market share um, and that's been at the expense for bing and also um, yahoo hasn't changed that much uh, it's dropped a little bit and then DuckDuckGo um, actually has increased its market share. It's actually at 1%. Now, if you look at DuckDuckGo in the minute, I'll show you, it's actually exponentially grown, um, but traffic overall has grown. So, but it is taking a bigger share. And this is because of the privacy concerns. Now, interestingly, when you actually um, look, a lot of the data that's presented in DuckDuckGo actually comes from Bing. And the other thing that, and Bing is Microsoft, uh, and the other thing that you may or may not be aware of is that um, uh, Bing has a very good share in desktops, but a very poor share in mobile. So Bing's uh, target audience is often older. It's a lot of B2B and, will, um, and you often get a, a higher conversion rate. So I definitely think about this. If you if you aren't um, being found in Bing and, and DuckDuckGo and Yahoo, you do need to look at that side of things. And also, uh, the, it's definitely considered doing ads in those engines as well, which we'll come on to in a second. When you go over to Bing, um, I actually really like the way that this page is laid out. Um, what they do do is in, in O2, what we've got here is O2 phone deals. The actual shopping ads go all the way across the page. Um, you've got your um, three ads uh, text ads on the left hand side and if you're not aware of this you can have a shopping ad and a text ad from the same company um, and if you look across here you might find there's three or four ads from the same company as different products are shown depending on how many deals they've got um, you have to go down to this bit here to get the organic so this is the start of the uh, organic seo and this is um, a feature that they produce which is almost like little cards but you'll also notice the brand panel over here on the right um, which is um, being uh, fed through there as well. So um, that is really useful to if you can get found for your own brand over on the right hand side. If you then go to Yahoo, basically most people use Yahoo for news and for email, etc. And you just put a search, it then produces search results. And what's really surprising about this is that you actually haven't got any organic results on this page. Um, that is all ads and it goes down, I think, another four or five uh, before you actually get to um, the organic results. Also, it's nearly impossible to actually see where it says ads. And in fact, what it does is it says these ads. And then what happens is a bit further down, there's a line where the ads stop and the organic start. So interestingly, Yahoo gets really high click through rates on um ads but also the cost per click is very cheap but you actually create you yahoo ads from bing 
So again, another reason to consider Bing because you can then opt to for your ads to be shown in some of these other networks. And they do have um, shopping and they have their own merchant center which drives um, the shopping ads as well. So again, often the, kit, uh, the cost per click is lower due to like, uh, lower competition and often uh, the conversion rate is higher as well. So um, if you're already doing Google and you've got a bit of a budget to spare, you can sync up your ads across to Bing um, and then um, you don't even have to set them all up uh, again. And most of the features that are in Google Bing copies. So they try and make it as seamless as possible. They, they've just, they took a, a view a couple of years ago that it's not worth reinventing the wheel. So that's why the, a lot of the features are exactly the same. DuckDuckGo, this is the end. This is the search engine that is all about privacy. Uh, they've got Bing ads as well. So uh, you've got um, shopping ads at the top, uh, just a couple of um, pay-per-click ads from Bing and then the organic results as well. Um, and again, these are being fed from Bing as well, but it also uses some other sources. So it uses um, an affiliate, um, I think it's Price Mapper, but I can't remember which one it is now. You should have wrote that down. And it also uses Amazon results as well. It um, does manipulate the results. It just doesn't take them straight. Um, and it does aggregate with a few other um, sources of data as well. So I'll just do a little um, takeaway from the stuff so far, sort of the first half of the presentation. So according to nearly every single similar web um, research that I've done, and I've done a lot this year, um, getting found in the search engines is still the most important way to get found, even if you have to pay for it. So even if you're not doing so well at SEO, if you can get found with PPC, um, that is gonna be the people that are most likely to convert because they're most active, they're actively looking for your product or service and they're most, you're, you're most likely to get um, leads or sales from them. Uh, building your brand is, is, is really important as that will generate direct traffic, but also people will search for your brand in Google. So if you wanna go and see how many people are searching for your brand, if you use one of the key phrase tools, um, one of my favorites is topics.seomonitor.com. Um, that's a great one for getting um, key phrase data, data without having to go into Google Ads itself. Um, then that one is uh, really good for finding out how many people are actually searching for your brand. And if you monitor that over a period of months, you can then see if you're actually doing a good job at developing your brand. Now, some sectors will have more paid search than others. Um, and this tends to be when there's um, uh, when there's not a lot of competition or research before purchasing or a lead. However, this is a great way and the fastest way to get new leads or sales. So um, what you find is, is that um, if you've got a, a sector where there's a lot of brands, really big brands, then uh, what happens is you get a lot of direct traffic and a lot of organic traffic for that brand. But if you're in your sector where there's literally thousands of websites, you know, if you look at something like um, gardening or um, or um, you know certain products where there's literally hundreds and hundreds of websites that do something similar then you can bet there's going to be a lot of uh, PPC uh, in that sector and interestingly and I do concur with da Daniel he said earlier on about the fact that people spend a huge amount of time in social media but actually they sort of expect to drive a lot of traffic to their website and that is not always the case I have a very much a view of creating site centric content, you know, create a great blog or a great um, webinar, um, use that, share it on social media, put it on YouTube, um, put it, you know, put it on your blog as well. Um, and then you'll get the SEO benefits of it, send it out in your email. Um, and basically um, from that one piece of content, you get multiple uses. Um, because when you do a lot of social media, if you're doing organic social, it's only your existing audience that will see it. And if you're doing paid social, a lot of the time, it's really about brand awareness and keeping them uh, and people will want to stay on the site. Now, I'm not dissing so paid social at all. We do absolutely loads of it and we do a lot of brand awareness campaigns. So I just need to clarify that. Brand awareness is still really important because that will get you these brand searches and it will get you direct traffic. 
but also it will get you those assisted conversions that Daniel mentioned earlier. So if somebody never heard of you before and they, uh, you know, and they see you in, in Facebook and then at a later stage, they then search or they then see you again, then that's really powerful. And the most powerful way of doing that is to do paid social video ads because they're really cheap. Facebook, a couple of pence, YouTube, a couple of pence and in uh, LinkedIn, sort of 10 to 50 pence. And then once you've uh, they've seen your you, uh, your video, you can then create a remarketing audience to do sequential ads and then drive them down the funnel. Now, the other scary thing about all this is, is just, just because th someone does a search doesn't mean to say that even if you're in the first page, you'll get a click through. Uh, and in fact, it might not be you only your site, anybody's site on that page. So um, and this is really because search engines a bit like um, social media platforms are trying to keep you on uh, their platforms and answer your questions. And they don't particularly want you to go off anywhere else. Um, and then another thing about this is, is that, you know, don't forget the other search engines as um, Google has more and more um, um, court cases against it all around the world. These are happening all the time. Um, there's a growing popularity, particularly if you're in Europe, to use um, the more privacy focus um, search engines such as DuckDuckGo. And I definitely recommend that if you use Bing ads, that that will get your ads into the other search engines such as Yahoo and um, DuckDuckGo. So it's definitely worth doing that as well. OK, so just a quick summary on how search engines work. And this is purely on organic SEO now. Um, so um, basically, um, your website is crawled um, using something called the Google bot. Um, if you imagine that every time um, this little piece of code com comes over to your website, it follows links and then it goes um, and it will come back to your site probably weekly, depending on how popular the site is. It will then grab that content um, and it will uh, have a really good idea of what's on your on your page. And then um, what will happen then is that there will be an algorithm that decides whether your content uh, is relevant to the search phrase that is being typed in. Um, and then those results will be displayed. Um, and so in this particular case, what we're really looking at is the content side of it, if it's great content. But if the if the uh, if the spider or the bot can't even get into your site or it's very slow or it's not secure or there's other issues, then that is going to um, influence what actually happens and whether you get shown or not. And there's you know hundreds of factors that determine what actually gets shown and, and what websites, what pages get shown. So when we talk about SEO, we tend to talk about the three main elements of SEO. There is more to this. Uh, I haven't mentioned local on here, but I just thought I'd quickly go through this and then I'm going to focus on some of the technical side of things. So first of all, we've got all the content. So this is um, this is the area that you control the most. It's about optimizing your page around topics and groups related for key phrases. We also optimize around something called entities or things. Of that sort of stuff that you know you get an entry in Wikipedia, and it's what it's the way that the content is written on the page, but it's also the title and the descriptions, and um, you know how how that um, the way that that um, uh, that page has got the content that you would see related to that topic. So it's not just having those specific key phrases. We then talk about off-page SEO. Um, this is a this is often described as the earned part. This is often the hardest part and it's often and it's reliant on other people linking to your site. You can do other things like digital PR, local SEO, brand building that they can that can be used to sort of speed up that process. Um, but it is a rather lengthy process. It can take years to develop the domain authority of your website. Um, you know, there's various tools like Moz, Ahrefs, which you can use to see what your current domain authority is like. And basically, in most cases, um, it's a score out of 100. And if you're lower than about 40, you're going to really have to work on the off page um, SEO and build links in order to increase the chances of the other side of things working. Uh, I did technical um, last in this case because this is often the area that's controlled by your web developer or you have a technical SEO specialist. Um, we've, we've obviously got a technical SEO team with Annika and um, we are trying to fix any issues on your site 
it's the area that changes the fastest and it usually overlaps with user experience. So things like having secure site, fast, mobile friendly, making sure that the pages are indexed um, properly um, and you're not blocking them accidentally. Those are the sorts of things that are really important. Um, and what we see is that the changes in the Google algorithm, which happen really regularly, much more regularly than most people realize, are generally designed to stop spam or to increase user experience. So when you're um, looking at your site, um, there's a load of best practices that I'm going to refer you to in a minute. Um, but basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to sort of reverse engineer these factors that Google um, take into consideration when determining your rank and then uh, making sure that um, you, know, you address all of them. So what I thought I'd do now is just talk through some of the big algorithm updates. Um, and the way that I uh, look at this is I'll go into analytics um, and I look at just the, the organic traffic. Um, obviously, there'll be um, algorithm changes within the other search engines as well. But I'll just look at the Google organic traffic. And if I sort of see a massive drop, particularly if you do a year on year, because sometimes websites can be highly seasonal. So you know, at the end, if you've got a if you've got a um, camping website, you know, you're not expecting to get much traffic at the um, at, you know when you go into October because most people have already bought um, bought a camp you know their tent by then. So you, you so I would have definitely recommend doing a year on year comparison in analytics. Just look at the Google traffic and see if you see any sudden unexpected changes. And of course, um, with a Google update, this can be both positive and negative. So you could see a drop or an increase. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was back in June and July. And uh, this is an interesting one because um, Google gave everybody a lot of notice about how they were going to um, make these changes around page experience. Um, and um, it was also include these elements of core vitals, which is a sort of technical term for the way that your site loads, uh, the speed of how it um, loads, but also things like, you know, as you load it, you've got your cursor in one place, and then as it loads, you know, you, the page jumps around. But um, what I can do is I can actually show you an example of a website um, and whether it passes or not. So the tool that you need to use is, um, this is Google's own uh, tool, is uh, pagespeed.web.dev. Um, and you type in the URL um, and basically um, what happens is you get a result for the mobile and for the desktop. Now, um, you can see in this case, the desktop site passes the core vitals test. And you can see that with all these different, um, these four different um, criteria, we're in the green. So the site, the site basically is it, you know, is loading pretty quickly within 2.5 seconds and it's fine. And um, although it can be approved because overall it's got a performance score of 71 and you really need to be sort of 90 plus, um, this is a, a brand new site um, and it, I know that it's been currently optimized to improve these things. It's also got a lot of big images on the site and so, you know, trying to improve it. But the thing about this tool and, and the other tools that you can use, and if you are a techie SEO, you would have been aware there's a Chrome plugin called Lighthouse uh, that gives you a lot more data, is that um, it actually makes recommendations of um, what uh, is what you can improve. And also, if you go into um, if you go over to Google Analytics, you can see additional data as well. Now, if you compare that to the mobile site, you get a completely different picture. Um, it was okay for this one, but the rest are just slightly too slow. They're over 2.5 and the score is only 21. So this is an example where the mobile site is not doing as well as the desktop. And that is often the case. Um, and this is a WordPress site. Um, and we know that sometimes WordPress sites can be slightly slow. Um, and you often have to um, do quite a lot of positive activity to improve them. Um, I'm just going to click through a couple of others. Um, you don't have, I won't read them through all now, but this is some of the other ones that came out last year. Uh, there's some nice links in here. Uh, I make reference to the uh, quality raters guidelines, expertise, authoritiveness, and trustworthiness. That's what um, Google asked its um, 
quality checkers to look into. Um, and so this is all about um, the quality of the content on the page. Um, this is an important one. There was a lot of scares about this. Everybody's um, rewritten their title tags to be optimized, but actually there was some re re um, a report out yesterday that in 61% of the cases, Google is rewriting um, the title tag that is actually sh the actual snippet that's shown in Google. So they're not using your nicely created title tag at all. So I think this means that you really need to be going to look at your H1 headings, the heading at the top of the page, as well as your title tech page in order to improve that as well. Um, and then this is all about link spam. Um, there's been many um, algorithm changes to try and reduce spam over the last few years. So this is quite a common one. Uh, Big update, this allows you to submit your pages into Bing, Bing through an API, which is much faster. This is obviously going to be useful if you're trying to be found in DuckDuckGo as well. So um, if you're a techie um, or you can talk to your techie, that's definitely worth considering. Um, and then there was another broad core algorithm update in November, but not much information. Sometimes they give you lows. Sometimes they sort of it quietly goes past and everybody's talking about it on the blogs. Um, you see, I refer to search engine land a lot. That's one of my favorite blogs for information in this in this area. And then also, if you've got a review site or you've got a lot of reviews in on your website, um, this is all about just improving the quality of the reviews and, and making sure that you're um, not putting. And it's really about trying to get rid of some of the fake and low quality reviews out there so that they, they get less visibility. And then with regards to looking forward, um, the, the nice thing is that DuckDuckGo has now passed 100 billion searches. This was in January. Um, Google's got a new tag to help you deal with duplicate content. Google doesn't really like content that's in more than one place on your site. So, for example, if you've got um, uh, content that's on your site or maybe you use an iframe for delivering a video or an image, um, then you can also uh, deal with that as well. Uh, Yoast, um, most of you will be aware of Yoast. It's a plugin that's used mainly in WordPress. But Shopify is one of the most popular e-commerce websites at the moment. And there's lots of limitations around optimizing for Shopify. So this is a, a very uh, you know, sought after plugin that is going to happen soon. And the one that I really wanted to mention was that um, page experience ranking that we were talking about for mobile. It's going to come in this month for desktops as well. So please go and check uh, using that tool to see whether you've got a problem with your page experience because Google wants um, users to have the best possible page experience. It's fast um, and it works great on both mobiles and desktops. Um, I just wanted to mention AI, uh, AI and machine learning. Actually, Daniel covered this in a little bit more detail, but we're now seeing quite a lot of um, uh, content right in apps um, which use AI. So I've given you a, a reference there to go and have a look to see uh, what you can do about doing uh, SEO at, at, at scale. So um, we've seen this massive increase in paid uh, search after the drop in 2020 when everybody um, sort of withdrew their advertising when people stopped um, in a lot of sectors, stopped advertising due to the pandemic. However, e-commerce really grew after that and we've seen a, a really big increase. Um, and what you see on the right hand side is that search has continued to grow. Uh, the other thing that is really massive is social display which is obviously social advertising. It wasn't really spread, spit out previously. So it was included in the previous years, but it wasn't split out as a separate. But I know you guys had a, a great presentation from the IAB yesterday. So I'm sure uh, quite a few would have seen some of this yesterday. Um, what I wanted to show you was changes in pay search by sector. So this is, um, it's, Ameri it's US data, but it's pretty relevant to us because um, we do have quite similar um, patterns. So what you'll see in certain sectors like B2B and nonprofit, the cost per clicks have gone down, but anything to do with e-commerce, travel and finance, the cost per clicks have gone up a huge amount um, and also the amount of ad spend that's gone up, even though in some cases the volume of clicks. So if you have a look at those on an individual basis, so this is um, B2B, you can see that the um, spend and the um, number of clicks has gone up significantly in Google. 
and organic clicks have also gone up as there's just been so many more searches and competitions increased. Uh, when you look at e-commerce, driving is completely driving the costs up. So the actual clicks in Google have gone down, but the costs, uh, the clicks and the budgets have gone up just to compensate for the level of competition. Um, and you'll see the clicks have gone down in, in organic uh, search. The other thing you may not be aware of if you're doing retail is just how powerful Amazon ads are. Um, um, not only do you have to pay a percentage for advertising on Amazon, if you actually want to get any visibility, you need to advertise as well. Um, so you've got um, a big increase um, the year before, which means this year uh, it's dropped quite considerably compared with what it was like. But look at the cost of clicks, massive increases in competition. And then the other thing I just wanted to show you was the increase in Google Shopping. Um, this is the ones at the top. Um, and that's just because um, when you have got a big increase in e-commerce traffic, um, a lot of that 80 percent or so will go to Google Shopping ads um, as they're so dominant. And obviously they take up a lot of space. So um, and they do convert really well. So that's why you get such an increase in uh, Google Shopping. OK, just a couple more slides then and then I'll pass over to a few questions. So um, if you've not read about this already, um, uh, there was an Australian lawsuit about uh, trying to ban Google um, because of the IP and other cookie identifiers. Um, Google um, ha is going to fight this and appeal. Um, but there's been so many people trying to um, basically control Google's power. Um, and uh, I think this is going to be really interesting because uh, Google, we are not in the uh, UK at the moment, but we do um, still have the GDPR regulations. So it's difficult to know what will happen in the UK um, and whether um, that's going to apply to us. But this is going to apply to any cloud service that transfers identical data over to the US. And that's because government surveillance, if you've got a, a CRM system that's based with the USA um, or any other sort of software, um, this is going to apply to you. So there's two things that can happen. They're either going to have to move their servers over to the EU, EU or um, the government are going to have to start doing things differently, which I think is less likely. So it's, it's difficult to know exactly what will happen. And it's also difficult to know what's going to happen to UK businesses because you know, are we going to adopt the same uh, guidelines? With regards to cookies, um, there was something called Flock, which was uh, basically federated learning of cohorts, which is a way of trying to disguise individual identities and put them in a flock with similar browsing activities. Uh, there was lots of criticisms about this because it put too much power in their hands. So they've delayed this uh, till 2023 and they've moved over to something called Topics, which only lasts for three weeks. Um, and there's going to be 350 categories. So other advertisers can use it as well. But again, watch this space. It's difficult to know exactly where that will go. Um, so just a summary then, uh, search engine marketing has become even more important since the first lockdown and is usually the main way that brands get to traf uh, traffic to their website. There's increased competition in paid search across many sectors driving up cost and clicks. Marketers, marketers are increasingly using paid social advertising in order to try to grow brand awareness um, and that's often at a lower cost um, than paid search. Um, and that will obviously increase direct traffic and brand searches. There's been a rapid increase in the use of digital PR, though I've not talked about that too much today. Um, there's been a real merging of PR and SEO. Uh, the proportion of clicks that you will actually get, even if you're in the top 10, is, is, is decreasing um, because the search engines prefer to show the answer them, themselves or push you down the results um, with more ads. Um, the algorithms are changing really quickly, um, but um, you need to be aware that the page experience and core vitals is now going to apply to desktops as well as mobile. Um, there's lots of changes to analytics and tracking, um, and that's a big concern and uncertainty. Um, so watch this space. It was good to see Daniel refer to an article he'd written. Definitely recommend having a look at that. And then tip um, on page SEO and paid search will start to converge. 
Um, this is because of the tendency to use machine learning. I mentioned something called dynamic search ads or DSAs, um, and that's where Google, it's almost like a paid SEO, where Google um, and, um, and Bing now as well, uses the content on your website to decide what key phrases you're being found for. So if you can optimize a page for SEO, then that's going to be better for PPC as well and vice versa. So really interesting um, developments going in that direction. Thanks, Anne. That was just amazing. So a fantastic amount of content. Um, so Anne, I'm going to I'm going to dive straight into questions. I'm going to see if I can get in as many as I possibly can over the next five or so minutes. Um, first question is: How important is it for a website to be accessibility compliant? Where can I find more information about this? Okay, so uh, there is legal requirements that your website is um, passes uh, the basic levels of accessibility. Uh, there is various websites if you do a search, but I know the www you know consortium w3 consortium has got a load of advice on that. The interesting thing about accessibility, a lot of the time it's about marking up the content on the page so it's easy to for screen readers, and that's also something that we need to do in SEO. So um, yeah, absolutely. If you've got an audience that you know are likely to be um, need a higher level, then you need to build that in. But unfortunately, a lot of the nice tricks and gap, um, things that look pretty on a site like JavaScript tends not to be great from accessibility. So if you have to go to the higher levels, you may compromise some of the design elements. So it's about finding the right level that's appropriate for your audience. Okay, um, a lot of these questions are going over my head, Anne, but I'm sure you know the answers to them. Um, is schema an essential part of technical SEO? Yes, absolutely. So schema is the way you mark up the page. Um, sometimes you see it, so for example, if you were looking for uh, West End tickets, you'll see a load of extra snippets underneath the listing of the dates when the next um, uh, shows will be. So it can be something as simple as that. But, um, you know, it's very difficult for Google to understand if you've got a series of numbers, whether that's a phone number or, um, or you know, some, a product ID number. So the more you can mark the page up, the better. Um, and there are lots of tools um, and WordPress plugins and Google Search Console has also got a lot of tools to help you with that as well. Brilliant, thank you. So um, next question, what do you see as the importance of microdata in SEO optimization? Okay, so microdata and schema are often interchangeably used, so it's almost the same question. So although I didn't really mention it today, the answer sort of applies. So anything that you can do to make, and, and there's a, you know, there's a belief that websites will become more and more almost like a database where, you know, there's, you know, you feel in the field, you see it with a product page, of course, on an e-commerce website, but I think that um, will definitely be the way things move in the future. If you want any information on this, the other person I recommend you look at is John O. Alton from Yoast. He writes on this subject all the time. He's a is um, a very close colleague of mine and an uh, absolute superstar and knows this stuff in a lot better than I do. Okay, I just remember there was one or two people at the start of the presentation asked for you to repeat the link for this was it topics. Um, oh yes, um, so SEO, seomonitor.com is a ranking tool that we use um, for measuring SEO, which is relatively cost effective and allows you to create key phrases and see the ranks and see the volumes, see a difficulty score. But it also has a subdomain called topics.seomonitor.com, which is free to use and it pulls in the data from, um, uh, from Google Ads Planner or Keyword Planner, um, but you can use it without needing to go into your ads account. And I find it really useful because it also suggests who the competitors are for your group of key phrases or that search. Um, and it also has quite a lot of trends data, cost per click data as well. So it's a, a really useful tool if you're just doing experiments to try and find. Um, obviously, there's lots of others, but I particularly like that one. OK, great. Um, when you spoke about paid speeds, you mentioned a Google Chrome extension, but the, the viewer missed the name. Uh, yeah, called. Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is the developer tool. Um, it's quite technical. I wouldn't personally use it. But Sook, my technical SEO, and Brad, our technical SEO team, they would use it. Um, but it gives a lot more information about what's happening on the page. So if you are a technical SEO, you probably already know about it. Um, but if you do some searches on things like 
Google PageSpeed, Google Core, uh, check my Google Core Vitals data, you'll find a range of um, sites. Um, one of the things I would recommend is where, because at the end of the day, it's Google that's making a decision on this, it might not actually be, you know, you can use something like um, a CDM, which is a, con a content uh, network, which will speed up your site. But at the end of the day, if Google thinks your site is slow or it's not passing it, it's Google's decision whether you get, you know, um, I don't think you'd be penalized, but I think uh, it's likely that, you know, you can get a bit of a, a boost if you are um, a compliant to these tests. Okay, great. Um, probably time for a couple more questions. And um, first one is, are there any different approaches required to maximize organic SEO optimization for Bing that are different from Google? Um, well, there is, um, this isn't um, an area that I know a lot about, but the most important thing is, is that in addition to Google Search Console, there's the equivalent in Bing. So I definitely recommend that you download that and, and, and um, install that so that you've got the code so that you can get that data in Bing. Um, Bing um, uses slightly different parameters. Um, there's lots of good, um, good articles on comparing Google and Bing. Um, also, the Google My Business pages, uh, the Bing local results come from a completely different source as well. And you put me on the spot because I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, it's completely gone out of my head. Um, but yeah, so they do do use different data and slightly different um, things are more important uh, in each of the two search engines. Um, but um, there's lots of really interesting articles comparing the two that I've seen in the last couple of weeks, to be honest. Um, so I'm not going to claim that this is my specialist area. Okie dokie. Um, final question then, I think this re refers to mobile, uh, search on mobile. So you mentioned that a lot of traffic doesn't actually go through to the web page that people will sometimes call. Is it damaging not to have a phone number for your service for this reason? Are there any other ways to, co to combat this? Um, I would definitely recommend having your telephone number anyway, because it's a massive trust factor. Um, I really don't like websites that don't have a very visible telephone number on the site. Um, you, 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 you should be setting up a Google um, business page or business profile, I think the name's changed in the last couple of months, uh, and put your telephone number in there. Um, I know that some people don't want a telephone number because they don't want to deal with loads of calls, um, but it is, um, I know that this is a problem. And if you, um, and when you look at local SEO, um, the phone number is a, an important part of determining, we call it NAP, name, um, address and phone number is an important part of determining whether you'll get listed at all. So you definitely um, really should, uh, you know, find a solution for that. Brilliant. Okay, um, that's really great. Thanks very much. And um, again, we had so many questions we were unable to get through them all. Um, but thank you very much. Um, so sadly, that's all the time we have for our digital marketing conference today. I'd like to say a big thank you to both Daniel and Anne for their excellent presentations, and of course the CIM East of England group for organising the conference. So on behalf of CIM, that just leaves me to thank our speakers Daniel Rowles and Anne Stanley once again, and also to say a thank you for joining us today. We do hope that you have enjoyed the sessions, and we look forward to hopefully welcoming you to our webinars in the near future. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>